Okay, let's start. Good afternoon <laughs> on my behalf. Uh, it's a great pleasure to host one of the final acts of, uh, of a great series of open science and research fora that we have had for four years. Um, we are finishing this in a very Finnish style, I feel. There's, I haven't seen any confetti or air balloons. And if they are appearing behind me now, you know who's the fool. Instead, in a very finished way, we, or all the presentations so far today, have put a lot of emphasis on continuity. Maybe some issues that we have actually done, even solved, but all the issues that actually are ongoing or we will need to do in somewhere in the near future. And that, I think, is also the idea of uh, this uh, discussion panel or, or the plan that we have put together, uh, how open science changes publishing process. Now, one of the great um, issues that I have learned from the Open Science and Research Initiative is to think about and talk about open science as an umbrella theme rather than all the little issues, or not little, but all separate issues of open access and open research data, etc. Uh, I'm nevertheless very happy that the, the given title brings open science on the table, but also brings us back a little bit on the core issue, the open access, how to make research results open. But that's not all. The presentations today we felt concentrated on what will actually happen now when the initiative is about to finish. What's the what are the next steps? And then the second set of presentations have discussed quite a lot of processes and methods on how we are working, uh, what are our ways of working at the moment. Our point of uh, starting point for the panel discussion was that, well, let's move a little bit forward. Let's not talk about the imminent future, but have a long-term vision on publishing process of scientific results. Basically, when there are the next generations uh, that will speak about open science, well, that will act according to it, what kind of an environment or community they are working at, what are the key issues there? And we will have two set of questions that we go through. In the first place, we'll discuss a little bit about what are the preferred principles and practices for publishing research results in the future that we are not yet there, but we are aiming at. And what is actually this publishing process? Um, publishing is only one part of the uh, network or community that creates, distributes, critiques and discusses about research results and, and, and the platforms where they are published. How do we take these different tasks and people uh, in, the, uh, in the picture, in following Jukka Mönkönen's work, how do we manage this hassäkkä, a hassle? And then the second round, Nevertheless, who are the key people or key institutions uh, in the development of uh, publishing processes? And then from, our many, from the national or domestic point of view, what are the differences, the balances or conflicts in between domestic and international academic publishing? Now, it's, I'm, I'm very pleased that we have four great discussants uh, to tackle first these issues, and then we will open the discussion for you to, to comment. But I'd first like to introduce to you uh, our panel shortly before we go to the discussion itself. Uh, firstly, uh, as you have as heard, Caroline Edwards unfortunately couldn't join us, but we are very glad that Dr. Sven Fund a managing Director of Knowledge Unlatched agreed to join the panel discussing very short notice 
Thank you very much, Sven, for joining us. Kristina uh, Hormia Poutonen, thank you for joining the panel. Kristina is a director of Library Network Services at the National Library of Finland, uh, president of LIBER, so uh, leading the scientific libraries at, in Europe at the moment, and also the member of the Open Science Policy Platform of the European Commission. So we have a great domestic and international sphere covered there from the library's point of view. Oh, sorry. Uh, Director Federica Rosetta, welcome to the panel. Uh, Federica leads the global strategic networks at the Elsevier. We all know as a publisher of, for decades, uh, the most important journals that scholars through the world have so seeked to publish their work in. Uh, great to have your view in the panel too. And last but not least, Associate Professor Mikhail Laakso from Hanken. Mikhail has been studying open access development through the last decade or a little bit more too. And he's a member of uh, the European Commission's Horizon 2020 expert group on open access and publishing, as well as the chairman of the domestic mm -hmm. network of open access Finno. Welcome. So let's go for the first box on, on the right. Preferred principles, practices for publishing, and what is actually publishing process. May I actually ask, Mikael, can you start? We, I've asked each of the presentations to give a two, three minute presentation on this topic, and then we open the discussions. But please, Mikael. Yes, with, with pleasure. Thank you very much, Jyrki, for, for uh opening up the panel, and uh, I have to be fast, since there's many things I'd like to cover that I would hope would be part of just normal scientific communication when the next generation of researchers uh, start communicating with each other. But um, first of all, this is not a manifesto or, or demands. It, it sounds like a wish list, but I, I think I have a few, few points here I'd like to read out uh, and specify. So first of all, I'd like communication to be not just open, but transparent. And that resonates quite heavily with what uh, Robert Keeley uh, described the Welcome Trust journal to be, so that it's not just the final artifact that's made open for everyone to, to read and access, but also reviewer reports, reader comments, and other types of interactions uh, with, that relate to the artifact that can, can be made open. Uh, I'd like to see less weight on where something is published. So I'd like to see a more distributed and uh, competitive sy system for uh, communicating scientific advances. So less emphasis on elite outlets uh, that kind of hinder healthy competition, both with regards to price development and service quality when it comes to providing publishing services for researchers. So. More, more competition and more even competition. Uh, I'd like to see a reduction of redundant work. So nowadays it's quite a, a game to play when you submit a manuscript to a slightly too good journal and get rejected, <laughs> as maybe I'm the only one doing it, but you know, sometimes you get rejected and you resubmit to another journal. And that's just a waste of many people's time in, in having multiple reviewers looking at the same manuscript, uh, giving roughly the same comments to the same output, uh, it would be much easier if the, the review process would be more open and would include more people than just two pairs of eyes and maybe the editor glancing at it uh, in order to facilitate good feedback and also facilitate that the output will get published uh, and be made public. So I think it's just a matter of time before most written manuscripts become published somewhere. So couldn't we kind of straighten out the process and try to remove redundancy and reviewer burden from, from the equation, since time is, is limited. Uh, I'd like to see reduced financial thresholds for individu in, like individuals, researchers. There, I think the, mm, 
the practice of individual researchers having to finance uh, individual APC payments is not the future I envisage. There should be more infrastructure going on behind the scenes where there are deals made between institutions or certain kinds of mechanis mechanisms available that take pricing as far away from the researcher's conscience as possible. So I'd like to see more, more happen in that front. But I think that's maybe two or three minutes <laughs> and going slightly overboard, so we could maybe continue. Yeah. Thank you. I did ask the panel members to concentrate on one or two issues. Now we'll see if Mikhail robbed the bank. <clears throat> uh, Sven, is there something that you want to emphasize on Mikhail's ideas or add? Yeah, what I... On? No, right? Can you hear me? Thank you. Thank you. Doesn't get better. Do you hear me without? If I'm talking loud enough? Yeah, right. Okay, so I would like to stress three points, probably adding yeah. to, to what you said. Um, first of all, I would wish this discussion and debate to be format neutral. Everybody is just discussing STM journal articles. This is pretty boring and pretty one-way thinking. This is not research output. This is a very specific type of research output. And I think we have to be careful also discussing data um, that this is getting a, too much of a intellectual no-brainer kind of thing. Uh, because how do you discuss Kant, Nietzsche and all the other guys just based on data? That will not work. Um, I think that is something um, the discussion has in that respect to be format neutral. I think it has to be discipline neutral. And I think the, the whole discussion about opening up research has to focus on execution. Let's not look for the next big thing to do. Let's make sure that 20 years after we started open access, where only 20% of the articles are open access, and where we will be missing the goals of Horizon 2020 if not a miracle happens, let's focus on, it, uh, of, on execution first of all, and then go to the next thing. I think that is important for everybody to, to not explode uh, this whole place here, and to make both for libraries, for researchers, and for publishers, um, this is a place where research communication is getting better and not just more excited in different types of conferences. That's mm -hmm. what I would like to add. Thank you. Christina. Thank you. Before I start, a uh, little marketing. So there are three <laughs> fact sheets outside this, uh, this room. One on TDM, one on open access and one on fair data. So please have a copy when you go out. Uh, yes, th I think this is becoming more challenging as we move forward. Uh, several topics which I had in, in mind have all already been mentioned. But I, I'd like to start with sort of a basic principle. When we are talking about uh, open science, uh, we are talking about all kinds of outputs, as was uh, mentioned also in, in the Wellcome Trust uh, presentation. Um, what we are aiming, aiming for is, is wider impact, so wider impact in research, uh, in innovation and in, in society. Really, the, the openness uh, will, will uh, bring wider impact. Uh, today, our research output is, is uh, stored in closed silos and uh, in, in the future, sort of all content should be freely available, uh, accessible via TDM possibilities for, for example, really to, to pro provide the wider societal impact. Perhaps I stop on this. Okay. Thank you. Well, so the future, being a bit visionary, going really far now. So, sure. um, I think there is something that we remain that, so it's the need for validation, certification, dissemination of research to make sure that what we circulate is still good quality and ethical research. But beside that, I think what we see in terms of science communication is that science communication are opening up and breaking up. With opening up, what I mean is that you see that much of the content is made available earlier. There is a surge of preprint servers. There is much more communication of science via social network and networking communities. Uh, much more experimenting around open access and, I mean, for instance, you mentioned peer review and a lot of open peer review uh, experience there. At the same time, talking about breaking also uh, scholarly communication because what we see is that there are many more type of 
publication available and emerging. So it's not only publishing the final research base, but it's also publishing methods, protocols. It's about publishing software. So I think when we look at publishing process in the future, we are looking at something that goes throughout the entire research cycle. If we want to be more transparent, more open, we need to really publish early on time, really the first artifact that comes out of the labs. And publishing doesn't end just with publishing the, the, the final piece of article, but it's also adding technologies, tools, that enable to add on top of dissemination also, for instance, the opportunities for collaboration. So what you will see, it's a lot of innovation around, for instance, uh, NLP techniques, uh, how to add and enrich also the article on the final stage. Yes. Can we add something? Yes, of course. <laughs> um, uh, earlier today, we were discussing quite a lot um, the need for culture change. And I think this is the, absolutely the most important issue here. Yes. After, after that, sort of many more things happen. Um, and if I can only interrupt you on this, I think yeah. it's about a cultural change supported by a rewarding system which really support that. Because we can talk about, you know, is yeah. data the future? I mean, I had some visionary conversation about the future of publishing being about data being the main object for scholarly communication and article being the support in the supplementary material. I don't know, I cannot see so far, yeah. but where we are now is the very early stage and we can get only there if there is the right, right the reward system in place, for instance. May I ask Sven, maybe? Um, I, I do agree that the cultural change as an important issue, but at the same time, if execution is the most important, which is also very, um, uh, I do agree with that too, but these might be a bit contradictive issues because cultural change is more that everybody agrees and does, but I, I get the feeling from your point of view that execution is more like somebody has to do now, to make this happen. Well, I think there are two elements and I think it really depends of how closely you define the publishing or the full research process. And I think that's basically the difference that the, that the process that publishers, libraries, researchers get involved in is being extended um, since the last 20 years or so. Mm. I think there's nothing bad about the traditional publishing process has proven to be very stable, very reliable. It is just not very open and it's just very costly. I think mm. those are the two major issues about the, the traditional shorter publishing process. And I think it's really good to, to break that up and to mm -hmm. see how we can better support researchers earlier um, in, um, in this process and really take away a workload from them that they are not trained for. So if you talk, for example, in Germany, I, I did that with a few researchers, there are 44,000 professors in Germany. If you talk to a few of them, um, they say that about 50% of what they do every day is not what they wanted to do when they started mm -hmm. to become, become a professor because there is administration, uh, all kind of grant seeking and so on and so on. Imagine 22,000 professor years every year being spent on something which they, are, which they don't want to do and which they are probably bad at, right? Because this is like us repairing our cars ourselves or growing tomatoes or these kinds of things. Um, and I think their um, publishing publishers, mm. libraries can really help. Um, and that is about execution. I'm just concerned at these conferences all the time that we are looking for the next big thing, which is always, I mean, remember three, four, five years ago, everybody talked about semantics. So where is it? What happened about semantic enrichment searches and so on and so on? We are very active in, on that topic here in Finland. <laughs> well, yeah, but but ask, ask publishers who have invested into yeah. semantic technologies and whether they made money on it, um, except Elsevier, I wouldn't say that there are so many. Um, and well, yeah, I mean, of course Elsevier. But I think what I'm trying to say is, um, I think it's also important that all these initiatives get a certain breadth because that is what publishing is about. It is a stable, reliable process and it only makes sense if it has a certain impact on everybody and not just on uh, Elsevier and the bio uh, life sciences or whatever. That is not a stable process. That is just bits and pieces of something. May I ask, maybe Mikael, you used the word communication rather and it came later on. This will not be the first panel that changes publishing to communication. But how do you see it from researchers' point of view? Uh, exactly, that's it. The, the whole process is coming well, I think more it, open, rather. Yeah, I think it ties into this publish early, validate, you know, 
as openly as possible and having less dead ends, like dead artifacts floating around the web and rather have, uh, <clears throat> I have to use the word, semantically interlinked uh, <laughs> entities or, or so, so that there is le it's easier to discover threads of kind of knowledge building and things that are connected together, but also the progression of an individual research project follows a easily discoverable you know, thread or, or breadcrumb line that you have. So maybe the publishing part, it gives me immediately, you know, metaphors to the printing press and something being over and done with and final after you've, you've published it. But I, I hope kind of even this current, currently very PDF-centric world that we live in within scholarly communication could move slightly towards more uh, interactive elements. Like, for example, again, the, the Welcome Trust example with having some interactive elements as part of the output. You know, you can have small sandboxes with applications that you can test data with or, or uh, you know, some, some interaction as part of the output. Right. But the, if yes, I may say, sure. I think it is, in general, I mean, we at Elsevier, we are not really calling ourselves anymore as a publisher, but more a global information analytics company, because indeed, it's a bit of a misconception to look at publishing as just, as you said, you know, printing and that's it, because you know that's not the reality. There is a lot of innovation going on and there is a lot of opportunities when it comes to collaboration and networking. So actually, we are really enriching the experience um, of eventually publishing. And you know, so it's, it's way much more. So I agree with you, maybe it's about talking about science communications, because there is a lot that actually is done nowadays really to look also into the public. I think the public, it's the other element that is so strongly becoming present in any strategies into how you communicate science. You cannot forget about you know, how you connect to society. So I like science communication in that way as, as, as a way of expressing this attitude. Speaking of public, we have a good start here, but how about there? Would you have any comments, anything to add? Did the panel miss something? What's going to happen in the future? What's your view? one. Very good. Yes. Thank you. I'm Heidi Leine from the Finnish Committee of Research Data. I'm also a doctoral student at the University of Helsinki. And, um, and uh, especially, um, Federica, you were talking about uh, data possibly being the main object of scholarly communication in the, in the future. And, and Elsevier being a more a global information analytics company than than a, a traditional publisher nowadays, and this is um, something that I personally have have seen uh, being involved with uh, with organizations such as um, Research Data Alliance and and CoData. Um, but how can um, we be sure that that the the same challenges that we are facing currently with the publications, they don't translate to, to the world of, of data. That um, um, how can we, we make sure that, that we don't end up with, with uh, having uh, research data behind paywalls like the, the situation is currently for, for a large portion of, of publications? And this is for the whole panel. <laughs> I'd like to hear all of your views. Yes, I, I mean... Um, believe me or not, it's not the first time I get this question. <laughs> no, I mean, I, I can understand uh, where you're coming from. I mean, what I can say is that, you know, at least talking from our perspective, data will remain are open and available. And that's why we also collaborate, as you said, with a lot of organizations that are building not only the infrastructure, but really thinking about the guidelines for depositing data. I mean, we are, about, we are one of the signatory uh, parties when it comes to the data citation principle and with 4C11. So definitely, that's not our intention. I mean, data will remain open, data are open, and we are really pushing researchers to submit data and to cite data. What you will see is that other commercial organizations, not only like SVA, but many others that are now on the market, will, of course, uh, start building services on top of the data. And, and that's pretty much expected. I mean, if you look at the conversation about, about research data management, for instance, you know, I've been talking with a lot of universities, and it's not so easy to do data, research data management. And some universities have already a number of infrastructures, some don't have it. 
So what you will see is you know, other company, commercial company to enter in this space and try to, again, serve the needs of researchers and support in an efficient way what you can do with data. But said that, data will remain open. Data are open objects. Because again, I think one of our very strong commitment, it's about reproducibility in science. And if you will look about all the things that we are doing nowadays throughout the entire research cycle, I mean, really, the goal is reproducibility. So it's not only availability of data, it's data citation principle. It's about top guidelines, but it's also about uh, having uh, registered reports, clinical trials, having very clear methods and protocols described. So there is much more that we are doing in that space. I hope that I answer so far your question. Thank you. Would others like to comment? I think the best option probably to keep data open is competition in that field. Um, because if I would be a shareholder of any company and have stock in any company, why would I have an interest in at the same time having data open? I think that is a contradiction to many. So I think um, what we have seen in open access that basically three major players in the field um, make up for 50% of the market share in open access by now making open access, access the most um, consolidated part of scholarly publishing um, is cynical because the reason why it started uh, open access was exactly to break that monopoly or duopoly or whatever you want to call it. So I think it is really a question of where researchers, where research funders, um, where libraries, whoever basically um, um, put their money um, and that is something that has to be part of the conscious process and not just believe um, that um, um, certain things will be open because what does it, does it help you if you have open data but you don't have the means to analyze them? Um, it is simply Definitely. useless. Mm -hmm. And I don't mean that against Elsevier. I don't want no. to uh, position it against mm -hmm. Elsevier, but I think it's always good um, to have open markets with open yeah. data and really making sure that there is as much competition on not only the data, but also the services on top of it. And I mean, you are not alone in that field, so... Sure, indeed. It's an open yeah. market and you see many players. Absolutely. And even if you look at what is doing the commission with, uh, with building the cloud, I mean, that is also... There is a layer of services that are served by commercial players. So yeah, absolutely. It, it is understood that there is that level of, of services that goes on top of it. Yeah, I would like to also to comment on, on this. I, I believe also in competition. And, and also different models. It's important that sort of there are different models around us and we can compare them and then choose sort of what would serve certain yeah. uh, scientific communities best. So the, really to see more innovative new communication models, that would be very good. Wonderful. Other comments, questions, please? No. Yes. Um, oh, very good. Thank you. Well, I'm sorry. I'm just arrived. Um, I'm a researcher in uh, legal history. Legal history means going from history, I mean, to the philological questions up to matters of, uh, of policy. And uh, I just uh, um, heard the last uh, um, exchanges about question of data. And of course, everybody is very much um, agree. We cannot possibly disagree that data must be open to everybody, therefore matters of competition and everything. But then I was very much interested to what uh, um, our colleague with a beard sitting down there mentioned analysis. The question is that for a researcher, data is just a minimal part of the research because we know that the, the um, data come after a process of selection. Therefore, besides data, besides analysis, I reckon that an important, um, an important activity to do on the data is a discussion on the, on the data. So therefore the question is, well, what can we do in order to ensure discussion, open discussion on, on, on the data? My question, yes. Thank you. Do you see platforms for the discussion? That's a very true question. There's been a lot of discussion also about how international conferences, are they really the best places to discuss, come together? These kind of panels, are these the best kind of ways of discussing? Are there other choices? Would anybody like to 
comment on that? Actually, yes. this morning uh, we heard about this idea about ecosystems, new ecosystems and, and plat platforms. Perhaps there, there can be sort of new, new, new ways, ways to communicate. Uh, of course, we, we need to, to use the, the tools, the IT we, we have around around us, uh, sort of really to combine different uh, research communities to allow multidisciplinary approach to, to data and this kind of discussion, perhaps around in Europe, around the Open Science Cloud, perhaps sort of there, there could be some, some new discussion forums could be formed. Yeah. And then sort of linked to to national environments. We don't have this yet, but... Uh. Yeah. Uh, yeah, uh, our experimenting goes via, of course, the Mendeley platform, um, mm. because it is, um, well, that's the intention that, you know, because you have a platform which is connected with repositories where data are basically early inserted into the cycle straight from a Latin notebook, for instance. So what you create is groups that are closed, open groups, where actually data is discussed already in, in that environment, and later on can be, of course, published and become uh, open to the public. And there is also an, an opportunity to embargo the data, depending on whether the, the research group uh, has desire to open at the later stage. So I think there is a lot of potential that the networking happens also around the data uh, and that's probably what I was kind of aiming at you know I mean is the future of scholarly communications also very much be centered and focused around data uh, with the knowledge that making data just open doesn't really serve a lot of purpose I mean to be really adding the value to data, you need to really address all the pyramid, the entire roadmap to open data, which is not only making reusable, citable, reproducible, also understood. So very often you need the context that goes along with the data, and that's why we see uh, this, this uh, emergence of data journals that give, give really the provenance uh, around the data. So it's it's probably what's going to happen that you will see much more that there are platforms that will address the needs to also generate this type of communities that really discuss the value and of specific data. Yes, I think the first, well, Evo already pointed very well out, the first platform to offer coffee will have all the Finnish researchers coming. So there's something to execute. Maybe we move a little bit to the second round of questions. We've been discussing already about the culture and execution, but where is actually the institution and the people that make this happen? Um, this in a sense that the initiative here in Finland has been great to bring people together uh, and do it together, but this is rather rare experience and effort in, in global settings, in my understanding. And, and from the National Funders' point of view, or my personal point of view, there has been various moments when scholarly commun community comes to the research funder to ask, what should we do? How should we do this? And it's not really up to us. It's the research community, as Rita Mayala was previously saying, how to follow the top of the wave that the research community is uh, uh, surfing at at the moment. That's the funder's position, not really uh, uh, working uh, in front of everybody. So what institution, what community, what group of people are the ones that are making the change here. And secondly, this might change a bit depending on what kind of scientific community we are discussing about. And of course, in our local environment, the domestic scientific community and domestic scientific communication is very important. How to keep that alive, how to keep that meaningful for the society. But at the same time, the Finnish research community put a lot of emphasis, of course, in publishing in international settings. 
Do these two spheres contradict? Do they balance each other? How do you see? Maybe if I may ask Federica to start this time. Yes. Um, well, in terms of where's the key role for development, support for publishing process, I think really because the, if we are addressing open science from an holistic approach as an umbrella of there's so many things that should change to make all the scholarly communication more open, transparent, collaborative. I think there is space for many actors, and actually, I think the collaboration it's a good way to go. Um, I think, you know, from the perspective of a publisher, definitely, you know, publisher have a lot of uh, experience, but especially are innovating at the moment and, and really bringing in a lot of digital innovation, which is important if we are addressing, for instance, just only the space of data but also looking into uh, the new tool and technologies that can really help the collaboration. Said so that, I mean, the changes are not only on the digital landscape, the changes are exactly on the, the cultural way, the, the approach, our researchers are approaching science. And in, and in that sense, you know, it's fundamental, the role of libraries. I mean, I talk with so many librarians and, you know, all the new skills the researchers are required to have. I mean, the libraries can really help a lot tremendously there in supporting researchers with the informations. Uh, same, I've seen a, a lot of more uh, involvement of IT department, for instance, uh, and funders. So my taking is that uh, it, there is so much that needs to happen to make some swift in some areas that uh, collaboration of, amongst all the parties, it's definitely what is welcome mm. and uh, will be very constructive. Good. Please. Agree on, on this? Does it work? My, I have a very special form of my head. <laughs> I can't keep the, this on. So yes, collaboration. But I, I think uh, it, it can. So sort of it's, it's important to also define roles and responsibilities in, in this play. So we have very many uh, stakeholders uh, involved, and, and we need each of them. But still. If it's possible to, to agree on, on certain responsibilities, I, I will think would think that this will speed the process. Uh, also, uh, now in Finland, we very often speak uh, on national level activities, so coordination of certain activities is needed. For example, skills development. We have very good experience on, on this uh, during the past years, and uh, I think uh, uh, it would be useful to, to continue this. As I also mentioned earlier today, raising awareness is needed in, in Finland, even though we have been discussing quite a lot of this, but more at European or global level. People don't know about open, open science. It was very nice to hear that you also stressed the importance of libraries. So I'm, I'm representing libraries here and uh, I, I had prepared to, to talk a bit more on, on this. But uh, sort of if, we, if we all can see that libraries can have a very important role in enabling this change happen, this culture change happen, and, and also in providing services for for research organizations and uh, of course also for for researchers uh, this this is good so i i won't go into details in in this but um, yes libraries are quite strong thank you Sven. well i would say that researchers are really back in the game um, and i think that both publishers and librarians are have um, basically to a certain extent lost control over um, the elements that they had under very strong control, rigid control before, which is funding on the library side. If you look at APC funds, it's more or less impossible for a librarian to have a word in how the money is being spent because it, there is probably a certain practice to do it, but the decision in the end is being made by the researcher. And I think on the promotion front, if you look into um, systems like academia and so on, research to, researchers today can do so much more themselves without the help of publishers or somebody else, um, that their role has really been, um, uh, or is now a much stronger one than it was 15 or 20 years ago. Um, I'm not so sure whether that's good or not, um, talking about execution and focusing on stable processes. I think it's just something that we can observe, that there is this myth or ideology that the uh, researcher can all do it themselves. If you talk to the large research institutions, then, for example, the Max Planck Society, 
then they always ask you, so what can we do to better promote our research? Suddenly there is this will again to centralize, consolidate whatever um, these different individual um, um, thrusts into one direction. Um, and I think it's really important that um, if we talk about a longer research communications process, basically, that libraries and, um, and publishers develop new skills. So um, looking at libraries in North America, for example, we have seen that in uh, Michigan, for example, um, that they really have um, huge departments to help with visual aids, um, uh, for example, how do researchers do better presentations, do better work on presenting numbers, presenting their research uh, in a way, basically preparing the publishing process together with them uh, without the involvement of uh, publishers at that point. I think that is really an interesting one. And publishers being less monoliners, but being more open about the number of services they are offering in a very modular way so that the researcher can decide, this is exactly what I want in this part of my publication, communications, whatever process, I think that would be really interesting. So just handing in an article or data or whatever um, and getting it published in a prestigious journal, I think will not be enough in, uh, in the future anymore. But I think the researcher deserves control over it, um, over what he wants, and the librarian can really help in educating the researcher because this is not their main job, right? I'm educating the researcher of um, how to get what they want, mm. whether it's impact, whether it's um, outreach to laymen, or whatever it might be. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mikael. Yes, yeah, so as for the first part of the question, like who should be in charge of facilitating this change, uh, my answer is that no one, no individual stakeholder or actor can really like make the change happen. But the, the positive side, as I see it, is that no one can also hinder it on their own. So even though if someone would object to this glorious open future that we are about to uh, embark on, uh, the momentum and the kind of just the willpower of the majority of stakeholders involved moving towards openness will kind of guarantee that we'll, we'll be there someday. But uh, I think the most important thing is that stakeholders from all categories, like research funders, uh, journal publishers, universities, experiment and invest in various types of uh, openness increasing models and mechanisms so that there's a kind of a, a war on many fronts rather than putting all eggs in, in one basket. So both scholar-ran, scholar-centric uh, initiatives in addition to top-down uh, approaches like offsetting deals and other types of uh, high, high level enabling of, of open, open access in particular. But for all of this to change, of course, investment means that money is available and, and currently a lot of the money that could be put into facilitating openness is put into uh, just enabling uh, ne necessary access to subscription-based resources. So. It's always a problem when you want, want more. You want openness, but you still have to pay an increasingly increasing sums for, what you, for, for the old service that you still need, the su subscription-based services. So th that's the main conundrum in, in coming up with uh, finances to invest while still sustaining the basic level of service that you, you're used to through, through the old, old closed system. But I see the need for collective action, experimentation with, with different models. I have no preference for scholar-run or top-down models as long as it works. But then, the, the other point, can I sure. acknowledge that? Sure. Like okay. domestic, domestic journals and, and international journals. And uh, <clears throat> I think I have a very Finnish perspective here. I, I'm not that familiar with how the dynamic looks elsewhere. But from what I've seen in Finland, there's been a very happy coexistence between domestic journals and then outlets that you know compete partly for manuscripts but ultimately I see it fulfill a slightly different role for scientific communication when it comes to what's submitted to a domestic journal and written for a uh, domestic journal and what's then written and submitted to, a, to an international journal and I think the societal relevance societal importance of domestic journals can't really be replaced by a venue that's internationally focused, that, that requires English 
as the only language that you can communicate scientific advances and uh, societal discussion on, uh, and particularly initiatives that leverage digital publishing. For example, in Finland we have this journal.fi portal that really enhances the societal uh, leverage that domestic journals can have. Publishing in Finnish on a free and open web page for anyone to read is really a great benefit that the paper-based past couldn't, couldn't provide. So I think domestic journals have it better than ever before in having the potential to be more inexpensive by getting rid of paper editions if they so choose, and then having essentially a global audience while still being locally relevant. So they're not closing off anything, they're just enabling more eyeballs on, on everything that they publish. That, that reminds me of the earlier speeches of, well, uh, concerning UCL and how, how bringing open access monographs, the, there is a concern that this brings everything down. But exactly, there was a good example that no, actually, it even emphasized selling uh, the paperbacks. And, and uh, well, your speech goes to the same direction, I yes. have a feeling. Otherwise, uh, coming from science administration, you're all stressing the multitude of possibilities. Uh, for administrative point of view, that's Bad. very difficult. <laughs> <laughs> but I understand the point. That, um, but somewhere there needs to be a value, uh, a value for different choices. But Christina, you want to? Yeah, I'd like to continue what Mikael said. Uh, so, as you all know, Finland is a small country, a small language, and um, so sort of when when we are moving to open access, actually we we have an exercise going on just now related to Finnish um, scientific journals. So uh, we, we can't find the founders of this approach outside Finland, outside this language group. And, and this actually is quite a big challenge for, for us. So there, there would need to be a very strong motivation on, on research organizations to move towards uh, the open, openness. Uh, and this makes us different from UCL, from UK, because it's a very big language group and, and they're Textbooks, for example, could be used here in Finland. But who, who could use our Finnish language scientific journals? Very specific challenge. But I'm mm. sure we will overcome the challenges we are facing today. But still, we, we do face some challenges at the moment. Right. right. Any comments on, on, on the Finnish context especially? Can I probably yeah. add one element um, sure. which might be interesting in this context? I'm, uh, in, in the consulting part I'm doing, I'm working with a publisher um, that has been working in Poland for 10 or 12, 15 years now, and they haven't published one single book um, in Polish language, just only mm. for whatever reason, German language and um, uh, English language books from there. It mm. turns out that the biggest, largest city uh, with uh, Polish people outside of Poland is Chicago. Uh, with a lot of research there, of course, on Polish language, history, all these kinds of things. Now, who would publish a book on German history uh, in English language? I think the, minority, the total minority of people. I think there are much more books on German history in German than there are in English. Um, and what I find really interesting is, uh, with this question, domestic versus international, I don't think it's a contradiction. I think um, the international structure, infrastructure, the, the fact that it is so easy to travel content from A to Z now um, is really a very good um, basis um, for these smaller national languages and also for these very highly specialized research interests. So imagine how difficult it was in Chicago a while ago, like 20, 30 years ago, to get the, the materials that you needed for your research in Polish language. I think that there is no contradiction between international and um, domestic, um, and I think that particularly smaller languages um, don't have to be afraid of that, but rather see that there is probably more of an expansion room into other areas that, that you haven't had in the past. Um, so I think that is not only true for languages that are being spoken by 50,000 people, but also by a few million people. And um, so in that respect, I can imagine that even, even, I mean, open access can even be more helpful 
for small languages because it's, um, it's much easier to coordinate. I mean, look at German. There are, what I don't know, 400 million German speakers in the world. The German um, um, uh, research community would always wait for the Swiss and the Austrians to, com to coordinate, and that will never happen, uh, I would say. So I don't think that a small community, which is relatively rich, is disadvantaged over a larger community, which is relatively poor. Um, so I can even imagine that um, the smaller languages, the smaller specialties, might go open access much more quickly than orthopedics or something like that, which is huge fields in, in research and which are very international and by nature English. You mentioned collaboration quite strongly. Uh, sometimes you mention also researchers as the key group. Um, in the first round, uh, I think it was Sven who pointed out that scholars nowadays have quite a lot of other things to do. Uh, administration, seeking for grants, now also taking care of the editing, review process, publishing such things. Um, what do you see, what are the issues that actually we should merit and value then? For example, in, in national funders' position. Nowadays, of course, we follow the idea that is presented or, or, or the background of the scholar, what kind of issues he or she has been publishing, where, and such things. But this, what is the new emphasis that we should bring in with openness? Is it just e exactly that, okay, whatever have you done, but have you done it open or not? Or are there, are, what, what do you see should be put in, in front? Yeah, can I jump in? Sure. It, yeah, I was thinking that I think definitely promoting openness should be uh, in whatever part, through your own research or being part of these collective action, you know, the common good projects you're providing software for an open platform or, or whatever. I think everything that advances scholarly communication, even indirectly, should be counted for in some way. But of course, there's not mechanisms for doing that yet in a standardized fashion. But I really like the idea that also providing services, like review services, editing services, whatever for outlets, be it journals or pr platforms, would be more formalized and, and valued somehow, or, or even capable to be, to be measured so that you can report, you know, how much essentially volunteer effort you have put into facilitating the publication and validation of work for works of others. So, and that of course is a necessary part, but it's all often invisible. It's time that you, is not accounted for anywhere. In, you spend reviewing and editing and if you're editor-in-chief somewhere, maybe that gives you a few few points here and there, but some, some more clarification on, on the, the part of this would be good. I was actually yeah. talking about the open peer reports with you earlier mm. today, because we are experimenting with that. So we started with uh, some journals where the editors opt in. We really started to publish the report that came out of peer review and was for us a way to experiment and see what's the reaction. Very interesting to know that uh, the majority of the editors were very happy about the results because apparently the reports get way more accurate and way, there is much more clarity given to the, to the researcher. Very interesting to see that the large majority of the reviewers that were approached said that they didn't want to be, remain anonymous, but actually they gave their name. And when they stay anonymous, they said that they would like next time to actually do it and, and, and give their name. But also what was very interesting is that the majority of those who did it and, uh, and disclosed their name, basically they used then the, the report, which is an open DOI report, to add it to their ORCID and then use it for indeed what you're saying, so mm. to get the reward. And so I, I think indeed this is a good point. And now the idea is to extend it to all the journals to really support that idea that uh, that is also a way to, to measure how we have contributed uh, to the openness and, and to the whole process. Obviously, I will say for our funders, I mean, most of the funding bodies are moving into supporting open data. So, obviously, m the majority are already uh, going into the direction of requiring so what you have done with your data. I had some conversation with other funders where they're also starting to think, how can we also 
and uh, recognize when there is an extra effort to really communicate to the public, so whether you have done anything in the area of science communications. Um, I would say also very interesting, uh, Christina also mentioned the multidisciplinarity. I think this is also should be one of the benefits of open science is that you should bring in more multidisciplinarity. So did you really make an effort to break down barriers and bring together different disciplines, especially in an area where we know there is related a uh, societal challenge, maybe there is a SDG goal that, that is uh, very much linked to that. Um, but it's not easy indeed to measure all these things, and, and that's why probably because what is needed is again this, this approach more of a basket of metrics where there is really a quantitative approach, but there should be also qualitative, so adding the, these extra bits, which by the way, it means asking much more to researchers. And I've been uh, in discussion around, for instance, altmetrics, where there were researchers, they were like, wow, we have so much to do to be competitive, to get grants, to teach, uh, to stay up to date, and to review. And on top of that, the miracle happened. I'm also a science communicator. And by the way, I'm a scientist. I'm not such a great science communicator. <laughs> so it's, it's very interesting, because I think there are many more things that we can expect, we would like to see happening from the point of view of the researchers, how they engage. And, uh, and they should be in some sort of way measured and, and rewarded in it. Yes. Any other comments? How did you feel if... Yes, please, if you can have a microphone back there. Oh, here comes. Hello, my name is Bo Krista Björk. I'm professor at the... Uh, Helsinki School of Economics. Uh, one aspect which hasn't been touched upon here, but actually what I'm going to say has to do with a lot of what's been said and transparency. That's the fact that um, when you choose where you submit your manuscript, it's like a big investment decision for you. It can affect your career. Mikal alluded to the fact that very often you're disappointed, you refuse from the first journal, you lose a lot of time. And what I'd like to see more in addition to you know, seeing review reports open, I've had articles done in that way, which is very nice, is that the journals themselves would publish more information about them and the service quality they offer to authors. And uh, Elsevier is doing that for some journals with uh, metrics on how fast uh, you pass review process on average and how long it takes to be published, but there's a huge variety. In biomedicine, it might be nine months or or eight months in, in business, it's 18 months on average. So if you refused after 12 months or, or 14 months and then resubmit, you really lose a lot there. So I'd like to see more. And another factor which is very important for authors when they decide where to submit is the accepted rate in different journals, which can vary hugely from the 5% in some absolute top journals to the 90% in predatory journals. I know the, the world average is about 38%, by the way, but uh, it would be very nice if, if journals would be forced by competition to actually publish uh, the number of manuscripts submitted per year and, and publish so that people would know, like when they go out shopping for a car, they would know much more about the journal and what they're really buying into. Thank you. Thank you. Any comments? Or? Uh. Just briefly, I mean, maybe something that uh, I, I know a lot of journals do that is they, they use a cascade system really to avoid that, you know, once um, an, art, an article has not been accepted in one journal, they will suggest whether you want to submit it to a journal which has aims and scopes that are particularly close or similar, and then, of course, they will put in contact with the editor of the other journals, and this is a little bit to avoid what Michael was saying you restart from, from scratch because reviews has already happened, so there is already a level of uh, scrutiny done, basically. I have also a feeling that there's a... Well, academic community as any workplace have a lot of silent information, and now we want to make it more available that everybody would have a fair game. But I saw there, there was a one hand. Yes, please. Hi, Pekka Orponen, uh, Finnish Committee for... Yep. yep. Okay, cool, yes, thanks. So, so there have been quite a few uh, items on, on data publishing and how data is 
becoming more and more central to the scientific well, process. So, and, and in traditional publishing, there are quite uh, well established uh, quality assessment mechanisms and kind of merit mechanisms. And this, of course, what drives a lot of the kind of the um, incentives of scientists to what, what they're going to do, and also very important for the university. So do you have any, any ideas of what would be the kind of the, the future quality assessment mechanism and the kind of the merit mechanism based on, 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 on data and data publications? Do the present uh, kind of models and mechanisms translate to data or, or do we need something new for when the when data becomes more and more central in the scientific kind of... Uh, kind of in um, okay, in in publishing. Yeah, how do you see the evaluation, or how do you get merit about from different research data? Anybody would like to comment well, on that? I, I think there is. We are there's still a lot of work to do be to be done there. I mean, uh, we are at the point where all the infrastructure are created for data uh, on national levels within organizations, uh, different organizations. I mean, what I see is that we are at the point where we are really very happy with the, we got into creating infrastructure that can really allow and support citations to data. So the next phase is, you know, to ensure that, you know, the merit, so uh, it's about, at a certain point, do we need to introduce also criteria to define the quality of the data that are s submitted? I mean, like a, a seal of certification about the quality of the data. So does the merit goes with that, you know, whether you have submitted complete and, and, and quality data. Um, I think it's, it's still, I know there, there is an RDA, there is one group which is specifically looking into that, into quality of data and whether merit would be attached to that. But at the same time, we know also the discussion around making data available also goes with a lot of limitation when it comes to, you know, some data that cannot be made openly available for a number of reasons. So it's not that you can, you know, in a way, there are also researchers that won't be able to make their data available. So you cannot uh, make it that uh, as a minus into the evaluation of their work. So th I think there is quite still some uh, uh, thinking to go with that. Uh, but definitely, you know, from a funding perspective, for instance, I can imagine that, you know, if you are supporting open data, understanding that there are certain data that cannot be disclosed, the other should be made available, so this should be a recognition for having made the effort to bring that to the, to the attention of, uh, of uh, other researchers, of course. Any other comments? Well, well, I could just chip in. I'm yeah. not an expert on this. I know Heidi is, so she can, she can scream silently <laughs> there when I, I misrepresent the current state of the field. But I have a hard time uh, imagining a system that would work without peer review of some kind, like human validation uh, and quality assessment of data that, like, I think it has to be manually kind of assessed to some level. And that's... There is, there is, mm. At the moment, I mean, in general journals that accept data, I mean, all the journals accept data, there is uh, much more of, of uh, I mean, not in-depth analysis as you will do with the research paper, but they are checked, of course. When you go instead in specific open data journals, and, and you see there are many more of those, then there is really a specific peer review of the data. So that's where more or less we are at the moment. And that's I'm what you see in, in, I don't know, if, since you are the data expert, <laughs> do you agree with that? I mean, this is what I, what I see in all discussion around data happening at the moment also. That, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah, and I think getting even at the level of getting citations for data usage would be yeah. good. I think that's a good place to start, like getting a normal that's, citation. That's excellent yeah. start. And, uh, and everything beyond that is, of course, just gravy, you know, getting more, even more credit than that. And, of course, I think those mechanisms should be explored. But, uh, but I think even just getting simple citations uh, yeah, towards your... We, we now implement it to all the journals, and I can tell you already that really from a logistic point of view was rather, I mean, I don't say complicated, but it takes quite a lot of time because you need to create new taggings, you need to really 
uh, train uh, people that work in type setting to understand that we are talking about different objects. So getting it ready as an infrastructure, it's already something. So we are there then, and now we're giving the guidelines and all the information. So let's see if the next step happens, which is, okay, we're starting to side. And of course, the other very important thing is that it's the creation of the infrastructure that link the data with the, with the articles that now exist. It's this project called Scolix, puts together all the organizations that uh, are active in uh, communicating data. But again, I think, you know, we don't repeat it myself, but it's about, you know, when you will see the creative the rewards, then researchers will really feel entitled to do that. Mm. There's a continuation there. Continue with one further question. So who do you think should kind of uh, set up this mechanism, kind of a... Uh, establish the criteria and, and I mean what, what, do the publishers have a role somehow a role in this or I mean and, and at Elsevier I'm sure you have been thinking about this a lot so how, how, how do you identify the quality data in, in your future business so to speak yeah, I, I, will you be providing some kind of assessment services and I mean there are different uh, organiza organizations that are working around this I think dance in the Netherlands for instance is looking into a ceiling of quality I mean we are involved we actually lead the group to look into quality of data I, I think yes the, the, the it, again it, when you define guidelines or commons of course has to be an effort for everybody and the first to recognize the has to be really the researcher that recognizes the, uh, you know, the value of that type of commons that you apply to data. So I would say that if we will get to the point where there is some sort of quality seals on data, some sort of metric, it's because that is generated by a community agreement. You cannot do those things without uh, being part of a community discussion, I would say. Christina. Yes, what comes to the question, who, who should be responsible of, of developing these criteria, I, I would say it has to be done in collaboration with the different stakeholders, so research funders, research organizations, researchers on, on that topic, so in, in collaboration. Um, so the Commission has established a high-level expert group on fair data, and the report should come out soon. Yeah. Um, it will be interesting to see what kind of recommendations there are. So after that has been published, it will come to the Open Science Policy Platform for further discussion, and uh, then then we'll see how how this moves moves on. But yes, collaboration it can be one one group. Mm. Very good. We are in the final minutes of the discussion. For the last thing from the panel members, I wanted to ask you, you brought a lot of issues, important issues to the table. Uh, what would you like to take out of this discussion back home? And now, put, to put a little twist, I'm, I'm guessing collaboration is going to be one. Yeah. <laughs> Which is just like, okay, that's, that's very good finishing line for a national collaborative meeting. Something else that comes to your mind? that you found very relevant and surprising? Uh, no, I think we started with Michael talking about transparency. I think that was the first word we started, and then we went to collaboration, which, which yeah. is always a lovely word, and, and I like that approach. But transparency, I think, very important. When to all this discussion, now we, uh, different elements emerge within the research cycle, and now the science communication online to that to really bring out this more transparent way of, you know, communicating research results. So I think this is a, a very important key element. And uh, I like the, the, to hear that there is, it, it's a transformative period. I, I think for almost all the stakeholders that were mentioned, you know, publishing, transforming researchers, taking more the lead, or maybe wanted to have just more choices, librarians having to, to jump into, you know, being able to support evolving needs of researchers so it's very interesting to see how we are all looking at uh, you know what is going to be the future we are always making we are making great as more steps depends on where we're looking at so i like this um this common approach and this desire to do the things also together thank you just the culture change, so we, we need to change the, the research culture, also the culture in our research organizations to become more, more uh, transparent, more, more open, uh, all the communication, 
decision making, sort of the whole whole process. So culture change. Very good. Thank you. Sven? Do I have to add more? I think this is enough already. <laughs> it's so already adding more. You're there. <laughs> Michaela, yeah, I are we sound missing? Like, like an echo in the room, but I, I think maybe not entirely the same thing as collaboration, yeah. just this collective action, like realizing that we have the same goals, many stakeholders have the same goals, and seeing the big picture, rather than everyone uh, fighting their own little fights, uh, we could all join in and have a big fight, and you know, pool our resources and uh, create something more than we could create individually. So I think taking a step back and uh, pooling together resources and time could produce produce something more than we could individually. Thank you very much. I think the final words that the panel gave describe very well the Open Science and Research Initiative that we've been living through through the four years. Now the task is probably to continue on the same track as the panel suggested. Uh, I would ask you to join to thank our panel members uh, for the excellent discussion that we have had to end the day, or we will continue a bit for, but well, thank you very much. <laughs>